Salam perpaduan to all our Christian viewers. Merry Christmas. I'm Jessica Lee and you're watching Updates at Noon. Now making the headlines today. Five states still affected by floods. Fuel tanker wedged beneath the overpass explodes near Johannesburg. The five states are still affected by floods with over 16,000 people forced to evacuate their homes nationwide. The number of flood evacuees in Sabah continues to rise as of 11 a.m. today, while in Kelantan, Trengganu and Sarawak, the number has dropped. The situation in Perak, however, remained unchanged since last night. In Sabah, the Secretariat for the State Disaster Management Committee, or JPBN, said the number of residents evacuated in Kota Balut increased to 212 people, involving 77 families, from 150 people from 49 families last night. A new relief centre, PPS, was opened at Dewan Sekolah Kebangsan Pekan to accommodate 62 people from 28 families, while at Dewan Sekolah Jenis Kebangsaan China Chunghua, the number of victims remained at 150 people, involving Involving 49 families. Meanwhile, in Trungganu, the state's JBPN secretariat stated that there were still 5,163 flood victims at 38 PPS in the flood affected districts, including Basut, Dungun, Marang, Hulu Trungganu, Setiu, and Kuala Narus. Over in Kelantan, the number of flood evacuees has dropped to 10,020 people from 3,269 families as compared to 12,830 people from 4,405 families last night. The evacuees are being accommodated at 27 PPS in Pasemas and Tumpat. The flood situation has also improved in Sarawak with the number of affected residents reduced to 1,056 as compared to 1,424 yesterday. And lastly, in Perak, the JBPN Secretariat said the number of flood evacuees remain at 75 people from 19 families and they are at two PPS, namely at Dewan Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan Abdul Rahman Talib and Sekolah Kebangsaan Sungai Tiang Darat, Bagan Dato. Now, Petronas, through Petronas Dagang Berha, donated 30,000 litres of diesel and 10,000 litres of petrol for rescue tasks and post-flood cleaning activities in the East Coast states. Petronas East Coast General Manager M. Ahmad Shazali Ramli said that the donation was distributed through a mobile refueling service using a mobile oil vehicle. In a statement, he said in addition to fuel, Petronas also donated basic equipment to 4,950 flood victims on the East Coast, including in collaboration with the Social Welfare Department through the Sentohan Kase Disaster Relief Program. The donation was part of Petronas's commitment to helping flood-affected residents worth 25 million ringgit, as announced in December 2021. He said the assistance included previous contributions to flood rescue agencies in 14 states across the country, in the form of 36 boats, 8,800 tents, 5,500 life jackets and 55,000 raincoats. He added that Petronas also expressed its gratitude to the authorities and hope that the donation could help launch the efforts of related agencies in rescuing flood victims since the disaster struck. The Ministry of Natural Resources, Environment and Climate Change, or NRECC, is fully focused on efforts to address climate change and its impact as the flood crisis has now become an annual occurrence. As Minister Nick Nazmi Nick Ahmad said, the Ministry would strive to take the lead to seek solutions to climate change issues as this is crucial to the future of the country. 
In a statement, Nick Nazmi said Pakatan Harapan had always prioritised the need to address climate change issues as evident not only through the PH Manifesto but also from Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim's proposal for the setup of a parliamentary special committee on climate change and biodiversity on the 4th of August last year when he was the opposition leader. In fact, he said the setting up of a ministry dedicated to address climate change shows the government has already taken immediate and positive steps to move towards a more sustainable future. He further noted that the ministry had on 19th of December proposed to the Deonrakia Speaker on the formation of a parliamentary select committee on the environment and climate change to assist the government in drafting clear policies and identify mitigation efforts in regards to climate change. Now, the Education Ministry has decided that the reintroduction of the Primary School Achievement Test, UPSR, and the Form 3 Assessment, PT3, will depend on the results of the tabling of the Malaysia Education Development Plan 2025 that is due in three years' time. Education Minister Fadlina Siddiq said any decision to reintroduce both exams would need to refer to facts and data collected throughout the Education Development Plan and not to existing tendencies. Speaking after meeting with Nibong Tabal residents at her service centre yesterday, she said the Ministry understands the parents' concerns after the abolishment of the exams, adding that they have to table the results of the Malaysia Education Development Plan report first to implement improvements to the education system. She added that the Ministry's current stand is to strengthen school-based learning for students to improve, progress and develop their potential rather than an exam-based approach as a holistic development development for children could not focus on one single aspect only. On a separate issue, Fadlina said that the Ministry is committed to ensuring that school session that was pushed to March last year will be returned to its original schedule in January soon, but it could not be implemented next year as several justifications were needed in accordance to the Education Act 1996. The Ministry of Domestic Trade and Cost of Living is currently in the final stages of discussions to introduce new regulations on the sale of non-subsidised fuel in border areas. A Secretary-General, Dato Azma Mohamed Yusof, said the programme called Border Economy, supply of raw 95 petrol and diesel without subsidy, among other things, allowed the purchase of fuel by foreign registered vehicles in states bordering neighbouring countries. Kita katakan model pembangunan ekonomi sempadan ini adalah kita nak tengok bagaimanakah kita boleh apa kata orang tu mendapat nikmat daripada nilai ekonomi yang selama ini sepatutnya kita dapat tapi telah pun hilang akibat daripada kegiatan-kegiatan apa ni penjelurupan dan sebagainya ketirisan dan sebagainya. Jadi dengan cara memperkenalkan satu bentuk model ekonomi baru bisnes atau perniagaan yang dikatakan boleh dikatakan apa ni berasal pada undang-undang peraturan dan diterima oleh pihak-pihak di peringkat sempadan ini maka sudah tentulah nilai ekonomi itu akan diperoleh oleh pihak kerajaan juga secara umum. According to Dato Azman, the move to allow the purchase of fuel without subsidy was made as there were cases where foreign vehicles were detected filling up with subsidized diesel in limited quantities but at multiple petrol stations. He said the program would start on a pilot basis in Perlis and the impact study will be carried out within three months before a decision is made to roll it out in other border states. The Entrepreneur Development and Cooperatives Ministry, or KUSCOP, has proposed the establishment of a council for the development of entrepreneurs, cooperatives, hawkers and petty traders in every district nationwide starting next year. Now, as Mr. Datu Iwan Benedict said that the council, which will be chaired by the respective district officers, is expected to be able to manage development and resolve related issues at the grassroots level more effectively. 
Dato Iwan said that previously there was a council for the development of entrepreneurs and cooperatives at the parliamentary level, but the council needs to be empowered and the council at the district level is proposed to be the best step to empower entrepreneurs, cooperatives, hawkers and petty traders. He added the ministry also hopes to boost the graduates' entrepreneurship programme in the country to further drive economic activities, especially the small and medium enterprises. Program seperti ini juga telah berjaya melahirkan uh, sejumlah usahawan yang yang berjaya. Uh, walaupun mungkin ada cabaran yang dihadapi oleh siswa saya ini, ada yang dapat uh, bekerja secara tetap di sektor lain dan uh, telah menghentikan uh, perusahaan mereka. Tetapi saya amat pasti uh, ramai yang juga kekal dalam uh, uh, perusahaan mereka dan ini yang saya mahu melihat, mahu berjumpa dengan. Mereka dan seterusnya melihat bagaimana program kosongan siswa saja ini dapat diperkasakan. The Selangor Health Department found 406 damaged and expired food products were still on display for sale during its spot checks at 36 premises, including supermarkets, mini markets, and retail stores in the state. Its director, Dr. Shari Ngadiman, said during the two-day food safety operation conducted in conjunction with Christmas celebrations this weekend, 6,127 food items and 944 food hampers were inspected. Explaining further in the statement, Datuk Dr. Shaari said of the total, 262 items or 4.3% were found to have expired, while 144 or 2.4% involved products with packaging damage. He noted that all the food products worth over 11,000 ringgit were ordered to be removed from the shelves and were confiscated for disposal under Section 4, Subsection 8 of the Food Act 1983. He said apart from the objective to ensure that food sold in the local market is safe and of good quality in accordance with the requirements stipulated under the Food Act 1983 and the regulations under it, the operation focused on food that has expired and has damaged packaging but were on display for sale. Datuk Dr. Shari advised consumers to always read the food product labels and check the packaging condition to avoid buying expired and damaged food items. foreign segment, Russian attacks on Kherson leave at least seven dead. At least 10 people were killed and 40 others injured in Boxburg, a city east of Johannesburg, South Africa, when a fuel tanker exploded. Emergency services on Saturday said the tanker, transporting liquefied petroleum gas or LPG, got stuck under a bridge close to a hospital and houses on Saturday morning. William Nadi, spokesman for the emergency services in the region, said they received a call around 7.50 a.m. local time saying that a gas tanker was stuck under a bridge. The firefighters were called to extinguish the flames. Unfortunately, Nadi said the tanker exploded. One of those injured was the driver who has been taken to the hospital. Of the 40 injured, 19 are in critical condition, while 15 others are seriously hurt but in a stable condition. Nladi said six firefighters were also lightly injured. There was no immediate information on those killed in the blast. Videos on social media showed a huge fireball under the bridge, which the tanker appeared to have been too high to go under. It was carrying 60,000 litres of LPG, which is used especially in cooking and gas stoves, and had come from the southeast of South Africa. Ukraine's presidential office said at least seven people were killed and 58 wounded in recent Russian attacks on Kherson. Now, presidential office deputy head Kirillo Timoshenko announced the casualties on social media on Saturday. 
Kherson regional prosecutors said Russian missiles targeted the densely populated city centre. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said in a social media post that the locations attacked are not military facilities and claiming that it is not a war according to the rules defined, but a terror attack. He criticised Russia for continuing attacks on Ukrainian civilians during the Christmas holidays. Now, hours earlier, Russia's presidential office rejected the possibility of observing a truce during the Christmas and New Year period. Now, some analysts warn that Russian forces may carry out large-scale attacks in February or early 2023. The Wall Street Journal quoted Ukrainian and European diplomats as noting that Ukraine is considering presenting a peace plan around the 24th of February, the first anniversary of Russia's invasion. Zelensky has already proposed a 10-point peace plan that includes Russia's withdrawal from all Ukrainian territory. The new plan is expected to demand large concessions from Russia. Now, six more bodies have been recovered from the sea after a Thai warship went down in the Gulf of Thailand seven days ago. About 17 members of the 105-strong crew are still missing. The HTMS Sukhothai sank last Sunday, roughly 37 kilometers off Thailand's southeastern coast, with a massive rescue operation managing to pull 76 crew alive from the waters. The Navy said in a statement that there is preliminary evidence that the bodies recovered yesterday were from the Sukhothai's crew, adding they would be subject to DNA testing. Six other bodies retrieved in the past week have been identified as Sukhothai crew members. Helicopters, unmanned surveillance aircraft and warships have been combing the sea in hope of finding survivors. The search also received support from various local agencies, volunteers and the private sector. The vessel, a corvette among the smallest of military warships, ran into trouble after its electronic system was damaged. According to the U.S. Naval Institute, the Sukhothai was commissioned in 1987 and built in the United States by the now-defunct Tacoma Boat Building Company. A clashes broke out as members of the Kurdish community in Paris gathered on Saturday for a demonstration to demand answers over the killing of three Kurds in the French capital. A gunman carried out the killings at a Kurdish cultural centre and nearby cafe on Friday in a busy part of Paris's 10th district. Police arrested a 69-year-old man who the authorities said had recently been freed from detention while awaiting trial for a sabre attack on a migrant camp in Paris a year ago. After an angry crowd clashed with police on Friday afternoon, the Kurdish Democratic Council in France, or CDKF, called on its website and social media channels for a gathering from midday on Saturday at Republic Square, a traditional venue for demonstrations in the city. Several hundred people gathered in the square with many holding flags. Paris prosecutor Laura Beko said that possible racist motives would be part of the investigation, but Kurdish representatives said it should be considered as a terror attack. Friday's murders caused particular dismay in the Kurdish community as it prepared to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the killings of three Kurdish women in Paris. Now, Twitter has restored a feature that promotes suicide prevention hotlines and other safety resources to users looking up certain content after coming under pressure from some users and consumer safety groups over its removal. Reuters reported on Friday that the feature was taken down a few days ago, citing two people familiar with the matter who said the removal was ordered by the social media platform's new owner, Elon Musk. Now, After publication of the story, Twitter head of Trust and Safety, Ella Irwin, confirmed the removal and called it temporary. Irwin said Twitter was fixing relevance, optimising the size of the message prompts and correcting outdated prompts. The feature, known as There Is Help, places a banner at the top of search results 
for certain topics. It has listed contacts for support organisations in many countries related to mental health, HIV, vaccines, child sexual exploitation, COVID-19, gender-based violence, natural disasters and freedom of expression. By Saturday, the banner returned to searches about suicide and domestic violence in multiple countries. Twitter bans users from encouraging self-harm, though consumer safety groups have criticised the company for allowing posts that they say violate the policy. A newly appointed national mixed doubles coach Nova Widianto from Indonesia claimed that his decision to join the Badminton Association of Malaysia or BAM was due to his confidence in the potential of the current players and their world rankings. Nova said his confidence grew after witnessing the many successes of the country's badminton squad under national doubles coaching director Rexy Mainaki, who has taken the team to the highest achievement on the global stage, including the World Championships this year. The 45-year-old coach added that his respect and belief in Rexy was in fact the main factor for his decision to join BAM as the mixed doubles coach. Nova also said that mixed doubles players in Malaysia and Indonesia are similar, as they are young, have good ranking, professionals and a lot of potential. Nova said he had already received the offer to become the mixed doubles coach at the World Championships in Tokyo, Japan back in August. The BAM appointed Nova as the mixed doubles coach on the 21st of December to replace Paulus Furman, who had resigned in April. Nova and his mixed doubles partner Liliana Natsir were the world champions in 2005 and 2007 and added the silver medal at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. The pair was regarded as the best ever mixed doubles pair in the world during that era. Moving on to football, Malaysia whipped Laos 5-0 last night to register their second consecutive win in a AFF Cup Group B match at the National Stadium in Bukit Jalil and move to the top of the group. Let's take a look at hockey. The list of injuries to players in the national hockey squad has reached an alarming stage. But head coach A. Arul Silveraj is not pressing the panic button just yet and remains optimistic that he will have a formidable squad before the start of the World Cup in India. Three main players from the squad have already been ruled out for the World Cup due to injuries, namely goalkeeper Zaimi Madderis, Nick Ayman Rosemi and Azrai Aizat Abu Kamal. Arul said he does not want to worry too much about the injury woes, but rather focus on the selection of players who can provide the best replacement for the injured, as well as help the squad achieve the target of reaching at least the quarterfinals in the World Cup. I'm not going to talk about injury, I'm just going to concentrate on the selection. So my mind is just focused on selecting the 20 best players, so I'm not thinking too much about injuries here. He also informed that the final date for submission of names to the Federation International Hockey, or FIH, is 30th of December, adding that the squad has forwarded the previous list. Arul said before the final selection of players, all players in the squad will be given opportunities to prove themselves that they are worthy for inclusion to the squad that competes in India. Meanwhile, Arul believes his team is ready for the World Cup as they have had enough matches under their belt recently. Now, Arul also said that the Speedy Tigers will play a friendly match against Spain on the 11th of January to tune up for the World Cup campaign that kicks off two days later. Saya rasa kita dah um, in this short period banyak sangat matches kita main. I mean we had uh, tour to Europe, we had Aslan Shah Cup and juga Nations Cup semua dalam jangka masa yang pendek. So I think I think it's okay. So dekat sana nanti kita akan main uh, satu perlawanan um, persahabatan dengan Spain pada 11 hari bulan. 
The 2023 World Cup that kicks off on the 13th of January will be hosted by India in Bhubaneswa, Rokela. Now, Malaysia opened their campaign in Group C against Holland on the 14th of January and Chile on the 16th of January at the Bursa Munda International Stadium in Rokela before facing New Zealand in Bhubaneswa on the 19th of January. Malaysia's best ever achievement in the men's World Cup was a fourth placing when Malaysia hosted the 1975 World Cup in Kuala Lumpur. The Malaysian Hockey Confederation, or MHC, will appeal for a bigger allocation from the Youth and Sports Ministry, or KBS, for national sports associations that has the potential to contribute medals to the country. MHC President Datuk Sri Subhan Kamal said a bigger allocation was important to associations to carry out development programs successfully and enable a rapid growth for sports in the country. Kita pihak KHM memang kita berusaha lah tapi apakan uh, daya kita usaha setakat mana boleh dan kita juga berharap bahawa uh, pihak kerajaan akan beri lebih banyak peruntukan pada sukan hoki uh, supaya kita sebagai pengurusan hoki ini kita nampak bahawa dengan adanya uh, bantuan lebih pada tahun 2023 pasti kita boleh guna pakai duit ini bukan untuk uh, reward players bukan tetapi to give them the best facilities. Datuk Sri Subahan said this when met by reporters at the presentation of incentives for the national squad in view of their success during the Sultan Aslan Shah Cup and the Asia Cup indoor hockey's men's and women's team yesterday. And that's it for this afternoon. In our top story, five states still affected by floods with over 16,000 people displaced. We leave you with visuals of Polish cities recreated in gingerbread for sweet Christmas treat. Each of the buildings required more than 300 eggs and 360 kilograms of sugar, as well as hundreds of kilograms of honey and spices. I'm Jessica Lee. Merry Christmas.